Thank you. Welcome and thank you for being a part of this wonderful book fest. And it is my honor and I'm so glad to be here. I had a chance to, to visit with Dr. Christine last night and um, I've never met a writer that also does tango. So uh, I don't know how she puts that in her writings, but uh, it served her well. The Louisiana, Writer, the Louisiana Writers Award is such an important part of this festival. And uh, it's just my great honor to be here, to be able to give it to such a deserving person. And I look forward to many more of your writings. It's, uh, you're an incredible person, and uh, hopefully we'll have a long friendship. So thank you, and congratulations, and thank you all for being a part of the Book Fest. Good morning. I'm Rebecca Hamilton, the State Librarian of Louisiana. I see a lot of your faces in here every year, and I'm always pleased to see them. Welcome to the Louisiana Writer Award. I would like to begin by saying that I couldn't be more proud to have this Lieutenant Governor here with us during this special time in our history, as we expect the largest turnout ever at the Book Festival. You may have noticed at the party last night, it was a full house. We expect that today, too. Um, it's Really, that great turnout is due in great part to his amazing communications team and his hard work all across the state helping us to promote the festival farther and wider than ever before, and for his support of the special artwork that you see on your program and on the t-shirts. There's a lot that is special about today, and I want all of you to know that we could not have a stronger supporter for literature and literacy in Louisiana than Lieutenant Governor Billy Nygesser. We're honored to work with him and for him as we help Louisiana see her fullest potential. And now, for the reason we're here this morning. The Louisiana Writer Award is given annually by the Louisiana Center for the Book within the State Library to recognize outstanding contributions to Louisiana's literary and intellectual life as exemplified by a writer's body of work. We have a notable past recipient list, and we are proud today to add to this distinguished list the name of Christina Vela, the 17th recipient of the Louisiana Writer Award. Christina, a native of New Orleans, received her PhD in modern European and US history from Tulane University. She has taught at Tulane as a visiting professor, and most recently in the Masters of Liberal Arts program. She has been a consultant and writer for the US State Department, NPR, PBS, and the History Channel. Celebrated both as historian and biographer, her books include Intimate Enemies, The Two Worlds of the Baroness de Bontalba, The Hitler Kiss, written with Radomir Luza, Indecent Secrets, The Infamous Murray Murder Affair, George Washington Carver, A Life, and Ataturk and the Unveiling of Turkey, in publication. And currently in publication is a, the, a long biography of that hero of secular government, Camille Atatuk of Turkey. Christina is also experimenting with fiction and writing a novel in which the main character is imaginary, but two other major characters are actual historical figures. When her first book, Intimate Enemies, was featured on the cover of the New York Times Book Review, Christina began receiving invitations to lecture all over the country. She still enjoys lecturing to groups, conventions, and academic gatherings on a variety of topics in literature, Louisiana history, and world history. In fact, she has prevented, presented several lectures at previous Louisiana book festivals and is presenting another later today on the Bronte family, this year bringing the 200th anniversary of Charlotte Bronte's birth. Christina has two daughters, Dr. Christy Ryle of Princeton, New Jersey, and Dr. Robin Vela Ryle of Houston, Texas, both with us here today. As a side note, I have it on good authority, as the Lieutenant Governor stole my talking point, that she has been seen dancing the tango in a Louisiana public library. <laughs> that makes us love her a little bit more. Susan Larson, our good friend and host of WWNO's The Reading Life, says, Intimate Enemies is one of those books that will be around forever as part of the Louisiana and New Orleans canon, and her Carver biography is fantastic. Christina is a writer who is generous and smart, and she is a great example of a scholar with an independent writing career. We are honored, Christina, to celebrate your writing accomplishments by presenting to you the 2016 Louisiana Writer Award. And we'll come, let's come right back here. Let's go I'm gonna take a picture first. Oh, okay. Picture time, picture time. Just to make sure we get it. Oh, yeah. This is 
gorgeous. You all have to come up and see it. It's just beautiful. Oh, I'm so grateful for it. You so you. deserve it. I see so many faces here. Oh, thank you. My daughter brought me some, honey. Don't oh, worry you, about it. <laughs> My little factotum. I'm so grateful for this award, and I'm so grateful to see all of you. I see faces that I love everywhere. Everywhere my eyes fall, I see someone I love. And you all were so, so kind to come. I know some of you went from fair distances. And I'm grateful especially to Rebecca Hamilton, who runs the State Library. The State Library isn't just a name. It is the repository of so much that is precious to all of us. And this lady is responsible for keeping it and keeping it available to us. It's a research institution. It's a, an institution for common people to go and do research and to find books and to find everything. It's a wonderful thing. Uh, and before I leave somebody out, because you know in the panic of these moments you leave out one of the most important names, I want to thank Billy Nungesser, our Lieutenant Governor. I have it on good authority very good authority, that Billy has been a driving force since the day he took office. He has supported this festival and the library in every way that he could. And you have no idea how important that is, because you can have directors who have wonderful ideas and wonderful plans, and if they get cut down by the administrators, there's nothing they can do. Cut down by the legislature, they won't give them funding or this and that. And Billy Nungesser has just been a proponent of this and promises to be even more so. And I mean, who would know that this coon ass is such a, <laughs> such a proponent of, of, you know, everything that's important to intellectuals and to common people. This festival is not an academic uh, conference. It's for families. You go out there and there's as much stuff out there for kids almost as there is for anybody. And there are cooking demonstrations and there are uh, dance and song demonstrations and storytelling along with very important serious books and all day long people giving lectures on those books. It's a great festival. Every state doesn't have a state book festival. Uh, only a few, and this is one of the best. And it's thanks to these people, to Jim Davis, to Robbie Wilson who works for it, to everybody, to all these volunteers, these people with these gar golf carts and all that, they're volunteers. They've come to give up their weekend to do this for us. So it's just a, a great thing. I can't think of anything that deserves more support than this festival. We are not a state that's just about eating and jazz. We're also about literacy, intellectuality, symphony orchestras, operas, wonderful museums everywhere. In every major city of Louisiana, we have museums that are well worth the trouble to go to, more than, more than the trouble. So we can be proud of those things, and we ought to talk them up and promote them lest everybody think we're just the backwoods like everybody thinks we are. <laughs> so I want to thank all of those people uh, and the board of the Book Center for approving my nomination. There are so many good writers they could have given this to, and I'm so honored to be in the same, uh, not class, but the same group that honored Shirley Ann Jackson and Ernest T. Jones, my gosh. I mean, that's, that's quite an honor. Uh, can I take this microphone off and walk with it? No, can I do this? You can do that. Can I do this? Can I do this? Yeah, you can do that. If I stand behind it like this, it's a little better, huh? A podium is just a disaster for me. Everybody thinks I'm the top of a head talking. <clears throat> well, there are other people, too, if you can bear with me, that I want to thank. Um, probably one of them is Noah Webster. Noah Webster, in the 1800s, spent his life, squandered his life, compiling 
a dictionary that would standardize the English language. Well, what does that mean to me? A dictionary is not supposed to be an authority. As you know, it's supposed to be a lexicon of what people say. But of course, over the years, as you look up to see whether something is slang or whether it's uh, you know, acceptable, it becomes a kind of authority. It's a very disappointing authority sometimes because I am sure that if I wait long enough, that awful usage of impact as a verb is going to become standard. And I, you know, he, he impacted me with his intellect. It sounds like intercourse, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> and all these other awful words that have become terrible cliches like iconic and I, I was opening a scholarly catalog the other day of scholarly courses, and it had in it the word, he unpacks an idea, he unpacks concepts, unpacks, unpacks, every single description of the course. I almost went crazy. And there was even one section that said, the course is very impactful. <laughs> but see, what happens is, you all, people, not you all, everybody, we use that stuff over and over again, and pretty soon it becomes acceptable, even if it's totally unacceptable. And we all start saying it, and we give in, and purists like me break down and say, oh, what the heck, you know, um, I'm leaving the world soon. It doesn't matter. <laughs> but Noah Webster tried to make that. When you consider that when Noah Webster was compiling his dictionary, he started, I think, around 1820, is that right, Ted? Started around 1820, and he did it for the rest of his life. He came out with it finally in 1850. And when he was writing, you could spell a word, weren't those the days, you could spell a word any way you wanted to, and it was virtually correct. That's why you see the names of things like Almanester all over New Orleans spelled some different way, because that was the way they were spelled. Whoever was spelling it spelled it the way they wanted to. And pretty much pronunciation was the same. Now, there was a loss in that if you read contracts that were written, say, by Irish contractors, you see these wonderful Irish locutions that nobody would say in America, but it's the essence of Irishness. And you want to read them just for the sheer joy of the language, because you can almost hear these people talking. So we lost that because he standardized all these words. But on the other hand, think what we gained. Think where you would have been all your life without something you could consult as to whether you were making a fool of yourself or you were saying something right or using it in the right way. So Noah Webster standardized our spelling, for sure, and gave rise to spelling bees. It's been so much fun for a lot of people and so much torment for others. And he deserves my thanks. I live with a dictionary alongside my desk all the time. There is, by the way, no more Webster's Dictionary. Merriam bought out Webster's, so there's only Merriam Webster, Webster dictionaries, dictionaries. Merriam is not the first name of Webster. It's a, a hyphenated name. Somebody else I want to thank very much for making my life really joyous, and that is William the Conqueror for uh, conquering Harold X in 1066. <laughs> the Norman Conquest, I'm, I'm not a proponent of wars, I generally hate them, and I hate the thought that so many thousands of people gave their lives in that Battle of Hastings, but at least something good, unlike most wars, something good came out of it. And what good came out of it was that the Norman language, the French language, or a version thereof, maybe we wouldn't recognize it now, was superimposed on the Saxon language. When the Normans came to England, the nobility, as you all probably know, began to speak, or had been speaking French, and they just superimposed it on the Saxons whom they conquered. The Saxon words like house and I don't know, all of the domestic and, and elemental words pretty much stayed the same because for a couple of hundred years, 
Saxon was the language of the lower classes, the defeated classes, and Norman was the language of the elite. French was the language of the elite. Well, gradually, for the first time in history, trickle-down worked. And the <laughs> Normans, <laughs> gradually, their French language was incorporated into English so that the result of it was we got two languages, essentially, from which we then developed our own English and American style. What this means for me is that English, I am totally convinced, and probably y'all are going to grab me afterwards and argue with me, it's OK, is the richest language in the world. Now, I don't know all the languages. I don't even know many of them. But I've fooled with languages all my life. I'm in no way fluent in anything, hardly in English. But when I look at these other languages and I try to do translations, I have enough familiarity to know that no other language that I have had contact with is nearly as rich in words of nuance and um, possibility and shading as English. If you try to translate something from English into another language, you wind yourself, you, you wind up using English, or using the same words over and over and over again until it drains the life out of what you want to say. If you take a concept like um, uncomfortable and you try to use it in a sentence, if you use it in foreign languages, you'll be very limited. You'll get synonyms like pain, uh, discomfort, you know, things like that, rather solid translations. You put it in English, you look in English, and you get unease, discomfiture, um, a sense of inferiority. You get all of these possible shades of meaning along with pain and aching and this and that for uncomfortable. And what makes those words available to us who can't remember our names half the time? Well, it's somebody else that I have to be thankful to. And his name was Peter Roger. Does it ring any bells? Roger's thesaurus. I hate to confess to you how frequently, how obsessively, I consult Roger's, Roger's thesaurus. When I'm writing the fourth draft of a book where I'm really starting to polish the writing and pay attention to what I'm saying and not want repetition and avoiding cliches, this is my bat noir cliches, I go to Roger's practically every sentence, because he'll have such a list. Even if I've thought of something that's pretty good, I'll check him to see if he's got something better to express a word or a concept. And it's really, you know, nothing, nothing in this darn life comes easily. If we think it comes easily, it's because we're ignorant of the process. Um, Roger collected over a two or three year period a thousand concepts, not words, but concepts that he wanted to try to catalog in his thesaurus. He was a physician and a polymath, a mathematician. He loved to catalog physiology. He was a student, a serious student of physiology, chess champion. I mean, the man just did everything. And because of his very active uh, physician's practice, he didn't really get to work on it continuously. But 20 years later, when he retired at the age of 69, he decided to take these 20 concepts. His model was Linnaeus, the um, man who classified animals and plants. And he says, if Linnaeus can classify all the insects in the world and all the plants, those are myriad, I ought to be able to handle a thousand little concepts. So he divided them up into a series, and he approached it with six series of concepts. So that the original Roger's thesaurus, the one that I started consulting when I was young, um, you'd have to look up a concept and then you'd find all of the words for it. Well, finally, somebody said, look, this is too much work. Let's put it in dictionary form, which cuts down a little bit on your access. But it still works very well. So 
with these concepts, he finally did it when in, uh, he was 69, I think he finally finished it at age 80 or something. He came out with it finally in 1850, and it has continued selling worldwide to the point that many thesauruses that are not Roger's, it's like Kleenexes, you know, we have Scotties and we have all kinds of Kleenexes, but they're still Kleenexes, right? So thesauruses are still Roger's thesaurus. And my God, where would I be without Roger's thesaurus? I wouldn't be getting this award because nobody would think my writing is anything special. <laughs> so I'm immensely, immensely grateful to people like this who devoted their lives without even knowing exactly, not only whether they would be a success in the sense of material success, but whether they would help people, whether this would just be something that dived to the bottom of the bayou or whether it would really turn out to be something worthwhile. So all these people I have to thank, and I have some more minutes, you're stuck here for a little while longer. <laughs> people have asked me how I write and I understand that this wonderful award has primarily been given to novelists and fiction writers and people who have real imagination, which I don't. Um, so maybe I thought, you know, when people call me, even people who are very literate people, call and they'll say, oh, maybe you're right in the middle of a thought and I'm interrupting you or something. If they only knew how little time you get to think about historical writing and how much time you get to just do grunt work, I think they would understand that, yes, I'm always busy, but I'm not doing anything as glamorous as thinking. <laughs> <laughs> to start with, let's say I have an idea, an idea for a book about Ataturk, which, by the way, everybody asks me, how did you think of somebody so outlandish, the Turkish dictator who brought secularism to the Middle East, to, to the Ottoman Empire, the former Ottoman Empire. <clears throat> Ataturk is exactly the kind of person we would love to have in the Middle East now because he was a forceful personality. He was a secularist. He didn't have any patience with any religion, and this is the religion-obsessed Ottoman Empire. And he brought reform to the most backward place in Europe in 15 little years. He was just phenomenal. That doesn't mean he was a total hero. There were times when he could be a son of a gun, and I hope I've brought that out. But anyway, they said, well, how did you get the idea for Ataturk? It was when reading general histories, I would come across this much information on him that would say, he was a dictator, that he brought Turkey into the modern world, that he secularized the country. And I said, wow, what a guy. How come I, there's only that much about him and there's that much about everybody else? So I started trying to read everything I could about him, and I decided this was really somebody who was worth a major biography. Well, where do you get the information on somebody from Turkey, especially one of the languages I never explored was Turkish, and I don't think there's enough life left in me to do Turkish. So this would be in a foreign language. And how do you do it in a country that is not about to let an American woman in on its archives? It doesn't even let Turkish citizens look at those archives. Well, the first thing is that you have to go to um, repositories of records of ambassadors and diplomats and envoys who went to the Ottoman Empire. The first part of the book is about the Ottoman Empire. Well, those repositories are in the British Museum. This would be where the dispatches of the empires are emperors, I'm sorry, ambassadors, are sent back to their government. So you go to the British Museum, and they have a calendar that's published online. I consulted the calendar. The calendar is a summary of their collections, and it tells you kind of what is in each collection. It has a little blurb about what you'll find in each of these massive collections. So let's say I pick a diplomat like Henry Layard, who went to the Sultan of Turkey and knew him very well and wrote, okay, Henry Layard's dispatches to his government, his letters to his wife about what he thought about the emperor, valuable, valuable stuff. His letters to friends about what he found in the Ottoman Empire. 
All of these things, plus the dispatches of all of the other envoys and ambassadors and people, uh, became part of the first chapter. Now, how did I get to Britain to the British Museum? They didn't lend out their stuff to the British Library and to the other repositories. I had stroke of luck, maybe there is a God, I had stroke of luck a friend who said that she had to go for several weeks and she would be glad to do the research for me altogether free and take all of the records and the citations. Where did this material, it's very important when you're doing historical research to know exactly where the document is that you found something. If I say that Ataturk used to like to bite his sister when he was a little boy, I jolly well better say where I got that. So it was important for me to insist on everybody who helped me that they get the precise citation in a certain form that I could use so that another historian, if he wanted to check that, could go and follow my citation exactly and find it in exactly the right place I said it was. And you have to do that with an historical work all the way through. That's why you're likely to have 100 pages of footnotes in a work of, say, 300 pages of text. And the person who did that for me was Dana Halpin. Is Dana here? There. Dana, stand up, please. <laughs> Dana had no historical training that I know of, but she made it her business to learn what I needed and I would tell her, okay, please go to this repository, maybe something more general, and look for this. This is what you're looking for. And she would skim those things, skim the calendars, and then she'd copy the dispatches and email them to me. This is basically the same thing as when I went to the Harvard Library and I spent two weeks looking at all of the books and the books from their Turkish collection some of them were in Turkish, I had to send them home to my translator. But what you have to do when you go to a repository like the Widener Library is they'll let you stay there and do research for maybe two or three weeks. You don't have time to read 200, 300 books and write notes on them. What you do is stand in front of the copy machine, pour money into it, and copy and copy and copy. You copy the whole book, basically. You get these books home because that's the fastest way. You can read them at home. And you spend maybe $1,000, maybe not that much, on just copy machines. You get all the stuff home and you have a stack of copy stuff that's as big as this table and as high. No kidding. And you go through them and let's say you have to start chapter by chapter. So you start out at Turk. Let's say I start with his childhood, okay? And I talk about the death of his father when he was seven. That's going to be the first thing in my first chapter. Well, I go through all of those books. Some of them may be about the guerrilla war. Some of them may be about Gallipoli. Some of them may be about his bisexuality. I better note that very carefully. His <laughs> drunkenness, all this kind of stuff. So in the margin of these photocopies, I write childhood um, love affairs and maybe by the name of the person, because I might have several paragraphs on one person, and all of that. Okay, when I'm finished going through everything that I think was about his childhood, and I'm not even thinking about Gallipoli or the War of Independence or anything that came after, I'm focused on the childhood, I write notes on every one of those books. Everything those books said, I write a note so that I have all the notes about his childhood in one place. That notebook may have 60 or 70 pages in it. Then, finally, I sit down to write the first draft. The first draft is basically a kitchen sink of all those notes. I want to make sure I get everything in, and I want to make sure that I'm careful to keep where it came from with the note. So every time I write Bites His Sister, I write in parentheses very carefully where it came from. Now, eventually, those notes have to be 
collated, as you know, footnotes have a form. If you're writing about literature, they follow something called the Modern Language Association style sheet. If you're writing about history, they follow the Chicago Manual of Style, which the darn people upgrade every year and change. So you have to, they want you to keep buying this terribly expensive book. So every year you have to upgrade it and write the style that they want. Okay, so you do that. You get all these notes and you write a first draft. The first draft, as I say, is a kitchen sink. It's liable to be 200 pages long for one chapter. That's the first draft. The second draft, I go through and start eliminating the repetitions, the things that I think are less interesting. I start to shape it. I move things around. Maybe I don't want to start when he was born. Maybe I want to start when he was five years old and go back to his birth or never talk about his birth. Uh, so I never talk about his sister for that matter. So I go through and I winnow it down to maybe about 70 pages. Now that's still too long for a chapter. Ideally a chapter should be 35, 40 pages depending on how important it was. So then I'm going to the third draft and this is where I start paying a little bit of attention to how it's written. One of the real lessons that I try to give writing students when I've taught writing, and I've been lucky enough to do that a lot, is to separate your ideas from the way you say things. If you stop when you're trying to write about a person's character, let's say, and you worry about whether you're using the right verb or whether this sounds good, you'll paralyze yourself. You won't be able to get it out. So, First of all, write what you want to say. Use any old uh, wording that you want. It can be, you know, semi-sentences. It can be crummy writing. Just get the idea out. You go back afterwards, you know what you want to say. Now you worry about how you say it. Now you polish it. Now you look for the right verb and all this stuff. So I write this third draft, and I'm still not too worried about style but it's beginning to take the shape of something that you can really read with pleasure, I hope. So I finished the third draft. Now it's time. Believe it or not, this part is the most fun for me. It's all fun because I'm learning about somebody I'm intensely interested in. You know, what writing is, is your mind fills up with something you're excited about and you have nowhere to put it. So you write it down. And you hope that somebody else wants to read it, but if they don't, it's okay, because you're rid of it. Now you can think of something else, and you've got it in a safe place. So after this third um, draft that is more carefully written, or is that the fourth draft, then I go back the final time, and I really take every sentence and try to make it as good a sentence as I can look at the paragraph, try to make it as good as I can. The most lively verb, no repetitions, no cliches, um, everything that I can do to make it better. And then I go on and start that whole thing off for the next chapter, for 15 to 20 chapters. So if anybody says, you know, this book was an overnight success. And I say, maybe it was overnight for you. For me, it was a lot of nights. <laughs> and it's just a lot of fun. Um, historical writing to me, and I'm going to get in a lot of trouble for saying this, but what I've discovered since I've tried to write fiction, and I did write a screenplay and a couple of other fictional things, is that mediocre fiction is the easiest thing in the world to write to me. You just sit down, you spell something out, it's okay, it's passable, it's read readable, and all you had to do was sit in front of the computer and just think it up, if you have an imagination, which I don't. Historical writing, to write a mediocre historical book is blood, sweat, and tears. Now, to write a great his novel, whether it's an historical, I hate historical novels because they're not truth, and if people are going to dedicate 10 or 12 hours to reading something, it surely ought to be, or a movie, it ought to be accurate because they don't know what's truth and what's fiction, so don't voice the fiction off on them. But if 
if you're writing something that's a great novel, that takes real genius. And it takes real genius to write a great historical work, too. I don't purport to write any of those. But writing fiction, in my opinion, is way easier. There's one exception. When I was writing this novel, I started, I figured, well, look, everybody's novels who have a lot of sex in it, they really sell. They're really popular. Why not? Let me load it with sex. It's fiction. Oh, my God. It is the hardest thing to write a sex scene that I can imagine. Even comedy, which is really hard, is impossible to write. It's very hard. But sex scenes, no wonder they're so dreadful. No wonder pornography makes you want to throw up. It's so bad. It's so hard to write. It is, I promise you, a thousand percent easier to have sex, even the first time, even in the most difficult circumstances, and to have it successful than it is to write the cheesiest sex scene you can imagine. <laughs> so anyway, all of this is to say that writing, uh, I'm very grateful for this award because writing has just been so much fun for me. It's not a career in the sense that I ever worried about who was going to buy it or what was going to happen to it after I wrote it. I wrote it with a reader in mind who is just like me, who understands me. So somebody who would want to read this just as I would. And I try to write the kind of book that I myself would want to read and would praise afterwards. It has insulated me. I've, I've always had to work for a living, so writing was on the side. That's another reason it's not a career. I never made my living from writing, not even the best, uh, the most successful book. Um, it's always been an insulation from the tribulations of life. Whatever was going on around me, I sat down, started working. Once, you know, if you're in the habit of working, it's just work. All that stuff that I described to you is just tedium. But it keeps you from thinking about the myriad other problems that we all have. And you're talking about somebody's life. He may have lived or she may have lived a long time ago, but these were real lives. This is reality. This is as good as fiction because it exposes First of all, what life was like when this person was alive, you can't help but find it out. And then what goes on in the interior lives of these famous or infamous people, and you find out, man, it's the same thing that goes on in my life. I'm connected to the human connection, to the human uh, community. So when I'm reading and doing this research, I'm peopled, my imagination is peopled with others, not with myself, not with my own problems. It's actually kept me from being a to I'm getting a signal back there, OK. We're not going to have a question and answer, by the way. Does that give me a little more time? Well, when I found out, I was just humble. I couldn't believe I was getting an award that Shirley Ann Grau and Ernest T. Gaines had gotten. I was just overwhelmed, and I thought, couldn't they find anybody better than me? But I was very grateful. What does writing mean to you? It means being able to be removed from the real world of problems and going into a magical dream world in a way that is also real, but it's not my reality. What's your opinion of a Louisiana literary? Louisiana is a very literary state. It's interesting. Mississippi and Louisiana, which get no credit for anything, have fantastic writers. We have, both states have a wonderful literary tradition and many great, great writers.